Hi, I'm Lee LaRavia. Today we're going to talk about point of care or bedside ultrasound of the gallbladder and biliary tract. Let's get started. First, let's go over some goals and objectives we're going to accomplish for today. We're going to discuss the indications for limited bedside ultrasound in the emergency department, image acquisition, what it takes to get the image. Then after that, we're going to discuss some sonographic signs regarding cholecystitis. Next, we'll talk about the practical algorithm that you can use to distinguish cholelithiasis versus cholecystitis and what to do as far as to clinically integrate that into the findings. And then lastly, we'll discuss some pearls and pitfalls. So first, why even use ultrasound for epigastric and right upper quadrant pain? Well, the answer is abdominal pain is a very common complaint and it comprises about 10% of yearly ER visits. And out of that, gallbladder and biliary disease are fairly prevalent causes of this pain. But let's face it, undifferentiated abdominal pain usually requires some type of imaging. By using ultrasound, you can quickly evaluate several organs and narrow your differential diagnosis. You can see here that just by placing the probe in the epigastric and the right upper quadrant area, you can quickly assess liver, kidney, there is some bowel, lung, diaphragm. You can also get a look at the gallbladder, which is what we'll be discussing mostly today. You can also get a limited view of the aorta. Basically, this helps accurately expedite a patient's disposition. Ultrasound has been shown to be highly sensitive at detecting gallstones. And ultrasound performed in the clinical setting is very similar to that performed in the radiology suite. And a very important thing is this shortens the length of stay and improves patient satisfaction. So what are some indications? Well, some primary indications would be abdominal pain, especially for right upper quadrant or epigastric pain. Some other indications would be nausea, vomiting, fever, jaundice. Also, any lab abnormalities, such as transaminitis, elevated lipase. And what about that elevated white count with the epigastric pain? So image acquisition, basically you're going to use one of two probes. You're either going to use a low frequency curvilinear probe, which we're looking at here. It has a large footprint and a large field of view. You can also use the phased array or cardiac probe, which has a smaller footprint and a smaller field of view. Patient positioning is key when performing right upper quadrant scans. You typically want the patient supine or in a left lateral decubitus. The left lateral decubitus position helps bring the gallbladder out from underneath the liver and is a little easier to visualize in some patients when doing the scan. Other positions you can use are semi-recumbent. And don't forget to have your patient breathe. You can have them take a deep breath in, inhale, and hold. Sometimes this respiratory variation can help you visualize the gallbladder a little easier. Usually we're going to use a subcostal approach. Typically you'll start midline just beneath the xiphoid and then move over about seven centimeters and this should put you in an approximate location to find the gallbladder. Other approaches you can use are the intracostal approach for people with kind of that quote unquote high riding gallbladder or you can use a coronal approach which you'll typically use in a fast. Basically you need to be flexible when scanning. Sometimes you may have to scan in several different positions, probe and patient, to get the view you need. Some liver basics. Since we're going to be scanning the gallbladder, the liver is the largest abdominal organ. The normal liver uh, is a very low attenuator, which makes it a very good acoustic window when scanning the kidney and or the gallbladder. Normal echogenicity of the liver is homogeneous with some low-level echoes. It gives this sort of salt and pepper appearance. Relative to neighboring tissue, the liver is hyperechoic to the kidney and hypoechoic to the spleen and pancreas. The liver is divided into three lobes, the left lobe, the right lobe, and the caudate lobe. These lobes are further broken down into segments, which are further divided into subsegments. Normally, the liver should measure less than 16 centimeters. Or if you just want to eyeball it, it should not extend past the inferior pole of the kidney. The left lobe is divided into the medial and lateral segment, and the right lobe is divided into the anterior and posterior segment. These are basically vertical divisions, and they're based on their position relative to the hepatic veins. 
you can see in the picture here that the left hepatic vein splits the left lobe into the left lateral segment and the left medial segment. Here's the middle hepatic vein. Here's the right hepatic vein splitting the right lobe into the right anterior segment and the right posterior segment. And you can see in the picture below that the caudate lobe sits between the inferior vena cava and the ligamentum venosum. Some more sonoanatomy. The longitudinal or vertical segments are further broken down into subsegments horizontally by the portal system, and they are known as the coronoids classification. This classification system consists of eight subsegments, which we'll not get into during this lecture. When scanning for the gallbladder, your ultrasound landmarks are going to be the interlobar fissure and the main portal triad, known as the portal hepatis, which consists of the portal vein, the hepatic artery, and the common bile duct, which you can see in this picture here. This is our portal triad with our common bile duct here, hepatic artery, and the portal vein. The thing about the portal triad is that the hepatic artery and the common bile ducts have some variation between patients. We'll discuss this later when measuring the common bile duct. Basically, the gallbladder is an ovoid structure with an anechoic lumen. It measures approximately 4 by 10 centimeters. It is made up of the fundus, the body, and the neck. The anterior wall thickness should be less than 3 millimeters. When viewing the gallbladder, you want to try to get imaging in two planes, as with any ultrasound imaging. You want a long axis and a short axis view, which relates to the relative position of the gallbladder, not necessarily the patient plane. And pattern recognition is, is key when doing any ultrasound. The portal triad has affectionately been called the Mickey Mouse sign. You can see that the common bile duct and the hepatic artery comprise the ears of Mickey Mouse and the face is the portal vein. The gallbladder and long axis view when it includes the portal triad also looks like an exclamation point. On to the biliary system. The ultrasound landmark when trying to find the common bile duct is the portal vein. The common bile duct diameter varies with age. It's usually less than six millimeters. It can be up to one centimeter post cholecystectomy. And a general rule of thumb is that you can add one millimeter for each decade of life after 60 years old. As we alluded to in a slide or two before, the common bile duct should be in similar size to the hepatic artery and smaller than the portal vein. When finding the common bile duct on ultrasound, you notice that it sits just superior to the portal vein which is here, and then your common bile duct lies right here. Sometimes you'll have to adjust your probe just ever so slightly to get that view. Remember that the common bile duct runs relatively straight compared to the portal vein, as opposed to the hepatic artery, which can be tortuous. When measuring the common bile duct, you want to measure the anterior inner wall to the posterior inner wall. You can see in this video here, we're showing the probe positioning on the patient. We're also showing the split screen with the ultrasound next to it. You can see that the gallbladder is coming in and out of view right here, and this is a long axis view with the portal triad. In this clip here, you can see once again a long axis view. Here's the gallbladder coming in, scanning all the way through it, down to the portal triad again. And this video in the corner here is a short axis view of the gallbladder. You can see short axis, and they extend down into the neck of the gallbladder. If you also notice in this top image, they're measuring the anterior wall. When measuring the anterior wall of the gallbladder, you want to try to measure as parallel as you can to the face of the probe. You'll notice that when they measure here, that they measure a little bit obliquely to the probe face. This can sometimes give you a false thickening of the wall. Some clips of measuring the common bile duct. In this top clip here, you can see the probe positioning once again on the patient with the split screen of the ultrasound. They have found the portal vein, which has the hyperechoic walls, and then just superior, they're measuring the common bile duct, inner wall to inner wall. It's important not to include the wall thickness when measuring the common bile duct. You can see in this clip below, once again, they found the gallbladder, followed it down. You can see the portal triad again. You can see this is a kind of a short axis view of the portal, and they're finding the long, long axis of the common bile duct. So let's talk about some sonographic signs for cholecystitis. 
There's the positive sonographic Murphy sign, which is very similar to the M Murphy sign found on physical exam. Presence of gallstones, gallbladder wall thickening, pericolecystic cystic fluid, and bile duct dilatation. These are some still images and one video clip of some gallstones. You can see in this top left image some very small gallstones with very little shadowing. It's not uncommon for very small stones not to cast very much shadow. You can see in this top right image a large gallstone with a very large shadow. You can see in this image in the bottom right a large stone. This is a wall echo shadow or a west sign. The gallstone is large enough that it has occluded the view of the gallbladder. You can see in this video clip in the bottom left of a gallstone in the neck of the gallbladder. This is a very common place to find a gallstone, so make sure that when you're visualizing the gallbladder, once again, you scan all the way through it in two planes. A lot of times, gallstones in the neck are missed. A video clip and two stills of some gallbladder wall thickening. It's another sign for cholecystitis. You can see in this top image, you can see them scanning in and out, and you can see this thick hyperechoic anterior wall on the gallbladder. You can see in this still shot on the bottom left, this is a short axis view, and you can see the hyperechoic wall once again. Another still image in the bottom right here, long axis view. You'll notice hyperechoic thick anterior wall. Pericholecystic fluid is a very good indicator of cholecystitis. Basically, it's edema surrounding the gallbladder. You can see here we've got a thick anterior gallbladder wall. You can see stones coming in and out of view here with some shadowing. And if you notice, here's our hypoechoic or anechoic stripe of fluid just anterior to the wall, which is our pericholecystic fluid, represents edema and swelling and inflammation. Here again in this bottom right clip, we see the gallbladder with the hyperechoic thickened anterior wall and a mild stripe of pericholecystic fluid there. Bile duct dilatation is another indicator of cholecystitis. In this bottom left-hand still shot, you can see the common bile duct here is the same size as the portal vein and as we said before the common bile duct should measure approximately the same size as the hepatic artery. When the common bile duct is approximately the same size as the portal vein it's known as the double barrel sign as the double barrel of a shotgun. You can see in the clip here in the top right they're putting flow on because they're trying to figure out which one of these is the portal vein and which one is the common bile duct because they're basically the same size. You can see the flow in the portal vein. You should see no flow in the common bile duct so you know that the structure superior to the portal vein here is the common bile duct and you can see that relative to the portal vein it's about the same size. You can also see inferior vena cava here. So we've acquired our images, we've done some interpretation of our findings. Now let's figure out what we're going to do with these findings and integrate them into the care of our patient. So you had a suspicion for cholecystitis. You decided to perform a bedside ultrasound. The first branch of this is you do your ultrasound and you find no stones and no findings for cholecystitis. You have normal lab work. You should consider another cause for your patient's pain. If you have no stones and no findings but abnormal labs, you should consider either consultation or further radiology imaging, whether that be a CT scan or an ultrasound in the radiology suite. Let's say you perform your ultrasound and you find stones, and you did your lab work, and your lab work came back normal. Your patient is safe to follow up as an outpatient. If you find stones and have abnormal labs, this leads us back over to the bottom left where you should either consult or further radiology imaging. And the last part of this is you perform your ultrasound and you have findings consistent with cholecystitis, pericholecystic fluid, thickened gallbladder wall, stones, positive sonographic Murphy's, bile duct dilation. Next step should be consultation, and this may or may not require further imaging based on what your consultant needs. So let's compare clinical-based ultrasound versus complete radiology right upper quadrant scans for a minute. From an emergency medicine physician standpoint, which is where I'm coming from, there are numerous studies that show comparable findings of focused or point-of-care ultrasounds to that of radiology-based ultrasounds. And furthermore, I believe in the hands of well-trained physician sonologists that these results can be extrapolated 
to other settings and specialties such as those in austere locations, physician's offices, and theoretically any clinical situation or location. The first study we'll talk about here was done in 2001. Basically, it was the performance and interpretation of the right upper quadrant scan by emergency physicians. In this study, they had 109 patients, 51 had gallstones, and 49 were correctly identified, giving a sensitivity of 96%. Of the 58 without gallstones, 51 were correctly identified by the emergency physicians, which gave us a specificity of 88%. And a very important finding here in this study was that 83% of the ED bedside scans were completed in less than 10 minutes which basically gives you a very quick disposition for your patient, whether that's outpatient surgery, consultation, or further imaging. Second study we'll look at here was done in 2010. This was a prospective evaluation. They had 26 patients who underwent cholecystectomy, and 23 of those had a confirmed cholecystitis. The ED ultrasound showed 87% sensitivity and an 82% specificity versus the radiology scans, which had a sensitivity of 83% and specificity of 86%. So you can see they're very similar in their sensitivity, specificity, and overall positive predictive and negative predictive values. The last example we have here was a study done in 2011. This was a systematic review. They had 917 titles that they searched and they had eight that met their criteria for inclusion and it gave them an overall subject sample size of 710 patients. They pooled all these estimates together and basically came up with a sensitivity and specificity for 89.8, almost 90%, and 88% respectively. So the bottom line is that well-trained physician sonologist performance or bedside ultrasound is comparable to the radiology ultrasound for cholecystitis and cholelithiasis. And remember, if you order a radiology right upper quadrant scan, it's going to take some time because not only are they going to evaluate the gallbladder, they're also going to scan through the liver too. So it's a more complete exam, but remember, we're answering a yes or no question. Yes to cholecystitis or no to cholecystitis. Now let's get into some pearls and pitfalls. First one is make sure your patient has a gallbladder still. This is very embarrassing to be scanning for a little while only to find out that, you know, your patient tells you a few minutes into the scan, oh, hey, um, I don't have a gallbladder anymore. So be sure to look for those scars. There are some normal variants to gallbladders, which is why we have a picture here of Papa Smurf with his Phrygian cap. This is a Phrygian gallbladder. It's just a normal variant. Remember, most stones are asymptomatic. There's also acalculus cholecystitis, which is rarely encountered in the emergency room. This is usually a finding upstairs in patients on TPN in the ICU. It is, however, uh, something that can be found in your older patients. So be aware of that when you're doing your right upper quadrant scan in the elderly patients when you think there's cholecystitis. And lastly, be aware of some mimics and other variants. Adenomyomatosis is a hyperplastic cholesterolosis. Basically, it's cholesterol crystals that are deposited in the mucosal layer of the gallbladder wall. What distinguishes them from gallstones is they have a comet tail artifact as opposed to a true gallstone which will have shadowing. And they also twinkle if you put colored Doppler on them. The spiral valves of Heister are located in the neck of the gallbladder and can sometimes mimic stones. And remember when scanning to find your landmarks that you use with ultrasound. Find that inter interlobar fissure and the portal triad. This will lead you once again to the gallbladder. You can see in this scan that they're scanning through and they have located what they think is the gallbladder. However, you can notice that they are not in the liver parenchyma, they're outside of it. You can actually see bowel peristalsis. So let's wrap up and review. You want to acquire your image, interpret your findings, and integrate your findings in light of the entire clinical picture. Remember, we're asking a specific question. Is this cholelithiasis or is it cholecystitis? And we've seen that radiology scans and bedside scans compare in their sensitivity and specificity. And not all of the ultrasound findings have to be present to have cholecystitis. And one of the important things is when you're performing your bedside scan, this narrows your differential diagnosis and improves your disposition for your patients for a very common complaint. Pointy care ultrasound for gallbladder and liver pathology is here to stay. This is a modality that's easy to learn, use, and transport with you and changes the management of your patients. Here's some references that we included for this presentation. Well, this concludes our presentation for ultrasound of the gallbladder and biliary tract. I'm Lee Laravia. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope you learned something today that you can use in your practice.
Thank mm-hmm. you.